So we're starting um, the first seminar, the first edition of our, of our weekly seminar series at TII. Um, and this is a great pleasure for me. So we have today uh, Professor Fernando Brandão. Uh, it's difficult to make um, a short introduction uh, of him. Um, even though he's a young researcher, um, he has been doing amazing things. Let me just go quickly through his uh, bio. So he did masters in the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil, back in his homeland. Then he moved to Imperial College for a PhD. When he finished his PhD, he stayed there for something like an year, if I remember correctly, before becoming an associate professor in Minas Gerais. So he spent some time back home as an associate professor. Then he moved to a res as a researcher at, at ETH in Zurich for a short time, if I remember correctly after which he went to Microsoft. And finally, uh, he became um, a Ben Professor of Theoretical Physics at Caltech. Um, and since there, so since, since he's been a professor in Caltech, he was also collaborating with uh, some private companies. He took, uh, he participated um, in the quantum supremacy experiment at Google. And now he's the head of the quantum algorithms um, division uh, at AWS, Amazon Web Service, right? So Fernando has done amazing things uh, already as a young research um, in his PhD. He was doing amazing things in entanglement theory and quantum complexity theory, many body physics, many things. Um, he won, he won uh, the, the, the 2013 European Quantum Information Young Investigator Award. And more recently uh, in the US, he won the Landauer and Bennett Award in quantum computing from the APS, right? So. I guess that's enough of an introduction. I'm also happy to have him here because I've known Fernando personally for a very long time. So it's really great. It's an honor to have you here. Fernando, hopefully we'll, we'll have you here soon, uh, physically as a visitor, but it's really a privilege to start our first seminar uh, with you as a speaker, okay? So let me just, bef before I give you the word, let, let me just uh, tell everybody that uh, if there are questions, please, please write them at the, at the Q&A, um, quant, quant, Quantum and Answer uh, link there. And then in the end of the session, uh, I can read them and ask the questions myself, okay? So you raise your hands and you, or you simply write your question at the Q&A uh, icon uh, down there, and then we can, we can have questions, okay? So Fernando, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Leandro, uh, for the nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to be speaking here. Um, and yeah, Leandro is telling me many great things about the institute you have there. Uh, and I hope one day also to, to visit and get to know some of you uh, better. So let me share my screen. Um, so Leandro said there will be a Q&A session in the end, right? But also uh, feel free to you know, ask any questions uh, during the talk. Uh, when I'm presenting these slides, if you, if anything is not clear, or if you want to ask anything, um, so I'm um, so the talk is about quantum computers, uh, and I want to tell. So it's there's like two parts to the talk. One is more general. I just want to tell you, you know, why, uh, how many people are thinking of building a quantum computer, and why we like to build one. Right, what we're gonna run on these quantum computers. Um, and that's more introductory. And then I want to get to the second part where we, uh, I discuss a recent proposal that we did at Amazon Web Services on uh, a theoretical architecture proposal for how to build a quantum computer that we think is promising and we are working on, on it uh, experimentally right now. Uh, all right. So what, what's quantum computing? Well, quantum computing explores the, the intricate physical level laws of the microscopic world to perform computation in novel and improved ways. Um, so we, many people, including myself, think that there is potential there for, for a new paradigm in computing, uh, which would be a big deal, right? But uh, it's also clear that there is very hard scientific and engineering challenge to build quantum hardware at the scale that we need uh, to get this new paradigm. Um, and, and really the best approach to build these quantum computers and what are the killer apps? So what, what is the cool things that we wanna run there? 
it's still unclear, right? So, so we have a very nice progress in both of these questions, but we don't have the final answers yet, uh, which makes it exciting to work in this field right now. Uh, so what is, let me start like, you know, we hear a lot about quantum technologies, right, uh, these days. Um, so let me start with, you know, just make a disclaimer, right, that what are the quantum technologies that we already have today and we have had for a long time. So like, maybe you can call quantum technologies from last century. Uh, so this is the point that quantum mechanics already uh, has been key to many technological advances, right? Uh, so for example, the NMR uh, technology or NMR machine, um, you know, if you need medical doctor, you go there and for many other applications, they only works because we understood the quantum mechanical description of molecules, right? That was key to make the NMR work. Or if you're using a laser or in the industry, whenever people use lasers, we have to understand quantum mechanics of lights, right? To build a laser. Uh, or even the building block of all our computing systems today, the transistor, they only came about because people master the quantum mechanics of solid states, right? Uh, so, you know, with quantum mechanics, we will not have these three things and, and many others. But it's fair to say that, you know, uh, we only have to understand quantum mechanics uh, to kind of tame the quantum mechanical effects, right? So we're not really, you know, interested in exploring uh, what some people call the weird effects of quantum mechanics. We just want to, you know, have be able to predict right, the materials of, 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 the, uh, of the solid here, for example, the properties of the materials of, or, or of the molecule and so on. Oh, sorry, uh, something happened here. Uh, and, and then we can operate mostly in a classical way, these objects, right? So um, now what we want to do next in quantum computing and in other quantum technologies of this century is, you know, go to the other extreme, right? So we want to be able to operate uh, systems uh, in, in, in a, you know, push the limits, the properties of quantum mechanics that sometimes, right, uh, they can be counterintuitive and that, um, and they can be hard to think about, but they can, nonetheless, they can lead to useful insight and new technology. So what are these properties, right? So let me just give a one slide review of quantum mechanics. So, so quantum mechanics, as I said, describe the physics of, of the very small, right? Of atoms, photons, electrons, and, and so on. The basic unit in quantum mechanics and also in quantum computing is what we call qubits, right? If you are old school physicist, that's just called a two-level system, right? It's just a physical system. For example, it can be an electron, right? An electron has a spin, it can rotate. And then there's two uh, uh, directions that this spin can rotate, counterclockwise or clockwise. And then if it's counterclockwise, it is called zero states in direct notation. If it's clockwise, it calls uh, one states uh, in direct notation as well. And okay, the, in classical mechanics, you have the same, right? The objective two states. Uh, and in classical mechanics, you can have some lack of knowledge about the state. So you could have a probability distribution over which of these two states, just because right, the observer doesn't know what is the right state. In quantum mechanics, it's similar, but basically replace the probability distribution over the states by what we call uh, amplitudes over the states. So now the physical state is a complex uh, number alpha uh, and, and this state zero plus superposition of a state, a complex number beta, amplitude beta and one. Uh, and they're related to a probability distribution if you take the square uh, of the absolute value and you sum, this, this forms a probability distribution, right? So if you observe the, the, the object, either you get zero or one, you get zero probability alpha square, you get one probability beta square. So in that sense, you know, it's pretty clear, it's pretty close just to some probabilistic right bits. Uh, but the fact that you go from probability, so amplitude has uh, dramatic consequences, right? So, so using amplitude instead of probabilities, we can have the superposition of objects, but they are really superposition like waves, right? So you can have interference between, uh, you know, many paths. And, and even if you have multiple objects like this, they can be correlated in stronger ways than probability distributions can. And this we call entanglements. Uh, so, you know, like quantum computing is really trying to explore, right? Uh, superposition, interference, entanglement in the right way and, and make novel ways of computing that we could, couldn't otherwise. Why it might be interesting uh, you know, why, why these new features of quantum mechanics, they might lead to better computation. That comes from, uh, you know, kind of a um, empirical observation in the last like 100 years, right? Since the, the, uh, the early developments of quantum theory that quantum is very hard uh, to study computationally. So this is the use of the Department of Energy supercomputer of the US by area in 2018. Every year they have this plot. They also have in recent years, but I, 
I didn't look up. I have to update this sometime soon. And and then you know, Earth Environmental Systems is the, is the is the foremost used. Then there is chemistry, material science, fusion energy, nuclear physics, high energy physics. So you see that like a large fraction uh, of this uh, supercomputer is devoted to simulating quantum systems, right? And and that's also true in general, you know, for other supercomputers. So and and the reason is that of course there is like you know. 50 years plus of development in computational physics and quantum mechanics, and there is better and better methods every day. But as far as we know, uh, in the general case, right, or for the hardest uh, uh, quantum systems to simulate, the cost grows exponentially. The classical cost grows exponentially with the size of the system. So very roughly, you need like two to the n uh, computational steps if you want to simulate a system of n qubits, right? Think about like n electrons and photons and qubits. Uh, and that's because exactly this phenomenon of entanglement between the qubits, right? So, so the description is just some huge wave function, right? With two to the n uh, complex coefficients, there is no way we can go to a probability distribution and just do some trajectory or sample over them. You really have to simulate this brute force. Of course, there's all these clever ways of doing many particular interesting cases, but as far as you know, this is the generic case, right? Uh, so just to give a scale, right? If you have like 30 qubits, this takes 16 gigabytes. It's kind of relatively easy too, right? 40 qubits or 16 terabytes, it's start getting pretty hard. 50 qubits is kind of like you know, this, we can call supremacy regime, right? The 16 pentabytes, it's like you need a supercomputer for that. And you know, as few as 333 qubits, that's already 10 to the hundreds, right? Like completely out of reach, right? Uh, it, I mean, we will never be able to do it, right? If you really want to do brute force on a classical computer. Um, and, you know, like uh, this is no right, for, for a few decades, but maybe the first one to point this out uh, was Richard Feynman. Uh, he had some very uh, insightful uh, um, um, lectures that he gave in 81 and he called simulating physics with computers. And, and he had this quote, he said like, uh, trying to find a computer simulation of physics seems to me to be an excellent program to follow out. Uh, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you wanna make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by goalie, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. So, um, so there's a lot of insights here, right? So, so first he understood that you know it's uh, it's very important, right, uh, to bring computation if you want to understand physics, right? Which by now, you know, uh, no one questioned that, but in '81 maybe it wasn't so clear, right? It was still early in the day. Uh, but then he notes that nature is not given by Newton's law by classical mechanics; it's given by right uh, quantum mechanics. Um, and, and, and then he already points out the idea of quantum computer, right? So if you want to make the simulation of nature and if nature is quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanical, then maybe you should use, oops, sorry, there's some, uh, uh, maybe you should like, you know, make the simulation quantum mechanical, meaning maybe you should use quantum mechanical systems to simulate, right? To understand the other quantum mechanical systems that you want. And he, of course, you know, it's not an easy problem, right? But that makes it wonderful. Uh, so maybe, you know, in, in a sense, in the, in, yeah, in the past four, 40 years in the development of, of quantum computing, we're just trying to make right, this vision of, of Richard Feynman a reality. Uh, after him, right, of course, he was not the start of the field. Very slowly, there was other pioneers suggested the idea. And then, uh, as we see later, it became bigger, more like 95, 94, something like this. Uh, and each time now, and, and these days accelerating even more the development. But I think he was the first one to mention the idea. So what is right this quantum technology? Hopefully, the quantum technology of this century, right? They're still figuring out, but then we hope you get there. So I will focus on quantum computing, right? So of course, there is also quantum communication or quantum sensing. This is uh, I'll leave for for another time. Uh, but in quantum computing, we want to use these well-controlled quantum systems for computation. Uh, the on concrete terms is very simple. The idea. Uh, so think about what is the basics, right, of our computers today. The basics, like really at the bottom level, right? Even though we have all this level of abstraction, so we never really think about it in these terms, but they are there, are these Boolean circuits, right? So there we have some bits, for example, in this case, A, B, and C, they are bits. And then we have logical gates, right? Which is a gates on, on one, in this case, two qubits, or two bits, sorry. They only do very easy logic on them, right? So for example, this gate here is an end gate, it multiplies the two, two bits. These are OR gates, it sums the two bits. 
And then, you know, if you just concatenate this uh, logical gates in the right way, you can compute some function of the bits, right? In this case, the function Q. But if you do large and larger circuits, and if you are smarter about it, you can do as complicated as you want logic, right? And that's how our computers operate. Uh, on a quantum computer, you want to do the same. So it's basically a way to run quantum circuits. What is this quantum circuit? It's just a physical evolution. But now we have our qubits, right? Uh, and then we have logical gates as well, but our quantum logical gates. And these quantum logical gates, they are either what we call single qubit gates or two qubit gates. Single qubit gates is just evolution the, that is allowed by quantum mechanics on one qubit. And a two qubit gate is evolution that is allowed by quantum mechanics on two qubits. So in this case, this is like the Hadamard gates that we call it maps zero into now right is quantum. So it's a richer class of gates. So of course it includes all logic classical reversible logical gates because like, it has to be reversible in quantum mechanics, but it includes more. So this Hadamard, for example, sends zero to superposition zero and one and sends one to a superposition zero and one with a minus phase between zero and one. Whereas this gate entangles them is a CZ gate, right? Depending on, on the state of the targets, if it's zero does nothing, if it's one puts a phase on, on the, on, on the target, depending on the state of the control. And then, you know, you can have a circuit simple like that, which prepares a quantum state in the end. In this case, the GHZ state. Uh, and then you can measure the states and hopefully, you know, this will get some interesting results that solves the computational problem, right? Uh, so in both cases, right, it's, okay, so it's clear that it's a, uh, it's a richer class of, uh, of like circuits that you can run, right? Which means a richer class of algorithms. But maybe it's not, and it's clear that you know if you just want to simulate this class of algorithms on a class computer, it doesn't work really because there's this exponential cost. But this doesn't mean right that you know this really give a gain. Right, that's another question, which is a hard question, uh, and I want to tell you about that. But before, let me just tell you, you know, in this, this quantum circuits, how people are trying to build this in a lab, actually, right? Um, and there are many ways, and it's unclear what is the best way of doing that. Uh, and I just put here four of them, but there are many more. Uh, so the one that, you know, we are working at AWS, but many other companies are doing, and, and many people in academia is superconducting qubits. Uh, the idea there is that you get some kind of, uh, you know, what you learn in school, right? Engineering and, and, and in physics, you have a LC, you have an electrical circuit, right? Like capacitors, inductors, and so on. But now you build them, everything with superconducting material, and you put a very, very small temperature, like millikelvin, and then what you see, as usually happens in quantum mechanics, for example, the, the, the state of the current gets quantized. Okay, so now the current can only take quantized levels. So it's given by quantum mechanics. And, and then if you have like an LC oscillator, right, that we learned in school, you know, right, this is, is like a harmonic oscillator in the currents, but now it's a quantized harmonic oscillator. Okay, so that, that's like um, this simplest quantum right system. So maybe we can use that to store information. But the Quantum harmonic oscillator is still not a good qubit, right? Because you know the energies are equally spaced, uh, so we cannot address the qubits. So then, what you do? You add a nonlinear element there. You, you add what is called just conjunction. It's a nonlinear electrical component that you can add there. And then suddenly, after you do it, you have a nonlinear harmonic oscillator. And then you can use the first two levels to store qubits. Okay, and that's how people do it. Uh, and it's nice because it's solid state, so you can just build it in a clean room in the lab, and it's there, right? It's also nice because all the control, right? So you control this by how? Well, we control with some flux lines, right? For the circuit with some drive lines. And this is all microwave. So there is all this, you know, classical hardware for the signal uh, they can buy and it works really well and it's stable. Uh, the drawbacks, I mean, uh, the, the, the quality of the qubits was very, very low when this started 15 years ago, but it is being improving every year. And nowadays it's comparable with the state of the art in other systems. So uh, scaling to a thousand qubits seems pretty okay with the cryogenic uh, system that we have today. If you want to scale to a million, it's less clear, right? And that, that's where the challenge is, right? How you build some cryogenic system that cools to millikelvin and can be scaled up, right? So a million qubits, that's uh, an interesting question here. Trapped ions, you know, they are the first to be considered, right? Uh, perhaps like uh, there was this pioneer proposal by uh, Sirac and Zola and then people in Innsbruck Rainer Blatt, they were doing experiments uh, like a long time ago and, and showing two qubit gates in the, in the lab, which was really exciting. So here you use a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, like a varying electric fields. And then this varying electric field they can trap a bunch of ions. So they are like positively charged ions, for example, a calcium plus, or people use many other spe species. 
and then you can put them in a line, uh, and then you can use electronic states to encode your qubits. Okay, so the qubits is storing two electronic states, but they also move, right? And when they move, these ions, uh, they interact, interact positively with, with, with their neighbors, and then they move as well, right? So they are, caught, they are you know, in, in some collective dance, and this is how you can implement logic between them, right? So if one moves, then another one moves, you use, you, you, you use lasers to couple them, and then you can use the lasers just in the right way that you apply a gate between a pairs of ions that you want. Um, so, okay, then I mentioned superversing qubits, the state of the art today is like 50 qubits, and, and, and the error rates are like 0.5%, right? Half percent, something like this. This was this Google experiment uh, that um, right, came in the end of 2018. Trapped ions, if you just have one ion or two ions, you can get very good gates, even like 0.1% for two qubit gate. Um, but it's more challenging if you put more in the trap. So, so maybe the state of the art is like putting, you know, up like roughly 20 ions in a trap and getting average 2%, 1.5% to keep it error rates. Uh, people have plans to scale this up, right? There's again, startups and university labs working on it. Uh, to, it's, it's conceivable that you can put like 50, maybe 40 ions in the same trap, more than that start getting challenging, but maybe you can connect many traps, right? Using optical interconnects. So again, there's some plan to scalability. There is some big challenges, but it's, uh, it's worthwhile doing. Uh, Rudberg atoms is, is, a, is a new approach. So here you use uh, neutral atoms, not, not ions, uh, but you excite them to the Rydberg uh, state, which is a very high uh, state uh, that is in some species. And then they strongly interact in these Rydberg states. And then you can use optical tweezers and just trap these at atoms any way you want. Actually, there's a lot of flexibility there, which is great. So for example, a group in Paris, they do this, the Eiffel Tower, right, of these Rydberg atoms. And then you can image them, see where they are, you know, uh, and, and correct if there is some defects if, if an atom flies away. Um, there is a lot of interesting work done in Harvard, for example, uh, on many body simulations using this. But people also start trying to do gates. It's newer, but it's scaling fast. So I think it's a promising approach. And there's people doing silicon photonics, right? Like uh, some startups like SciQuantum and, and many uh, university labs. The idea is that you can do everything in, in silicon, right? Which is great. So you can do some foundries to build it for you. Then you just use photons. You make these photons interact in the beginning with some nonlinear process like parametric dot conversion. Uh, then you build some complicated set of the photons. Then you just let them go in linear, linear optics. And you know, this, this part is easy. The first part is hard. Uh, again, right, it's, uh, there is, it's pretty challenging to make this work as everything else, but there are people trying, right? So there's many bets. We don't know what will pan out. And I think it's healthy that there is all these bets right now. Uh, if you know, any of them work out, it will be a big win for everyone, right? Now, why we want to do it? We want to do it because, as I mentioned, right, we don't really know the killer apps yet. And I think maybe we will not know them until we have the computer, right? So, so right now, you know, the, the way we develop quantum algorithms is with pen and paper, right? It's, there is only so much that you can do with that, right? So, so you know, once we have the computer, we can try a bunch of heuristics that probably work very well as we do today in our computers, but we cannot prove they work, right? Or we get intuition about it and so on. But we already have some striking applications of things we could do with quantum computers if you have them. And, but there's a big catch in this slide. And, and the catch is that we assume perfect qubits with no noise, okay? And I, and I will revisit that soon. Uh, but you know, of course the field really started uh, in 94 with a, uh, with a breakthrough result from Peter Shore back at at and now a professor at MIT. So he showed that we could break RSA which is the most widely uh, used crypto system, a uh, public crypto system uh, today, right? Whenever we buy something online, we are using RSA. And he showed that using, you know, if you want to break RSA with 2048 digits, which is what people usually use, 6,000 qubits would be enough. So basically he found a polynomial time algorithm for factoring, a cubic time quantum algorithm for factoring, which if you can factor, you can break RSA. Uh, so, so that's a big deal, right? And then many people got interest in, in, in quantum computing. This is a clear sign that as a computational model uh, or as a computational paradigm, quantum, quantum computing can be much more powerful than uh, normal computers. But of course, you know, hopefully this will not be the application of quantum computer, right? We don't wanna break other people's secrets. And there is people working on post-quantum cryptography. So probably by the time we build a quantum computer, you know, uh, we will not be using RSA and we'll be using some other public crypto system, uh, which is secure against quantum computers as well. 
but then there is like kind of going back to the vision of Feynman, right? So there is this problem of simulating physics and chemistry and material science. And there is where we think there will be a big game of quantum computing. So for example, you know, if you want to simulate some complicated molecule, this is Femoku, right? This is used uh, for people that are interested in understanding fertilizers better. That's a molecule which is pretty important in, in, in chemistry, uh, but it's very hard to simulate. And, and there is limits to what the, the best methods in chemistry gives today. With a quantum computer of like around 200 qubits, we could make improvements and have a better simulation of this molecule, we believe. In material science, again, like many problems of simulating, for example, high temperature superconductors, right? On technical terms, I mean simulating the, the Hubbard model here. Uh, starting, well, this would be like more 100, 120 qubits. Uh, we can also start simulating it and, right, and, and do something that is not possible to do today with our classic computers. And, you know, uh, these three examples, they are what we call exponential speed up. They are huge speed ups over uh, the classical best methods that we have. If we are happy with milder speed ups or with heuristics, then there is a large class of applications of quantum computers to optimization problems like scheduling, ranking, learning, you know, like uh, machine learning, uh, linear programming, and so on. Um, and if you had 100 qubits, you could start running them. And, you know, either then, then of course, right, if it's smaller speed ups, it depends how fast is the clock cycle of your quantum computer, right? But ignoring this issue for now, you could already see some gains with 100 qubits or so. Um, but there's a big catch here, right? Which, so, so you see, like, you know, you, you could make a big impact even with a relatively small number of qubits, right? Which is definitely not the case for our classical computers, right? Uh, so that's promising, but there's this big catch, perfect qubits with no noise. And, you know, the quantum systems, they are always noisy. We don't have this in the lab, right? As I mentioned, the error rates we have today is like half percent, right? And compare that with the error rates of the transistor. The transistor is a perfect bit, actually, kind of today, right? Uh, the probability of error in a transistor is a billion in a billion, right? So, so it's like, you know, it very, uh, we cannot even estimate it well, but it's like between you know, 10 to 15, 10 to the 18 is extremely small, right? So that's why, you know, our computers just work, but right? we don't have to worry about this. But that's not the case with qubits and, and maybe will never be the case with qubits, right? Because quantum are just more fragile and it's very hard to, to decouple them from the environment. So let me maybe jump this because of time. Uh, and just see, okay, so how, how we think, you know, how, the, another point is that the applications that we have, at least the applications that we know today they work, uh, they require these perfect qubits, right? Or at least extremely good qubits. And how can we get them? Okay, we can maybe just improve, right? The material science and, and, and get better qubits. But if you think about qubits everywhere, right? They, they, they are not improving, you know, the, the error rates of the qubits and of the gates are not improving more than a factor of, you know, two every two years, something like this, right? So if you want to get to these error rates for applications, and I'll mention what they are, it will take like a century, right? So, so there is no way that we can count, I think, just on the hardware improvement of gates and get there. So we need something else. Luckily, there is something else, and that's the idea of quantum error correction. And, and that's why we think we can eventually build a useful quantum computer. So the idea is that you can protect information from errors, uh, not just improving the physical process, but using redundancy, right? by encoding into more qubits or more bits in your information. So that's used classically as well, not for transistors, right? Not for computation, because as I mentioned, transistors are so good, but for storage, our hard, our hard disks are not so reliable. Actually. So we use error correction codes when you, we encode there. So what's the simplest way to think about that classical? Suppose you have a zero and then encode into five zeros in your hard drive, or you have a one, then encode into one, five ones in the hard drive. So now, even if up to two of these bits are corrupted and they go from zero to one or one to zero, you can still decode, right? Because you still you do majority voting. You see, you have like three zeros or three ones, and then you say, "Oh, okay, my logical information, my logical bit is zero or it's one, right?" So, so then, so then, you know, if the probability of error was p, after this encoding, the probability of error is proportional to p to the three, right? So you have like this exponential suppression in, you know, the the size of what we call like a, a, a code word here, right? In the size, in how many physical qubits you use per logical qubits, right? In this case, bits. Uh, and quantum information, we can correct this as well. It's more complicated, but there are ways of doing that. Uh, but it's challenging because, okay, this is the error rates, okay, of the gates. This is how well you can do the gates in the lab. This is what we call the qubit overhead, right? This is how many physical qubits we need per logical qubits for getting to a target error rate, for, to a target logical error rate. And in this case, the target logical error rate, uh, I'm assuming is like, you know, uh, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seven. 
which that be interesting for this application, right? But now, but now there is a curve. This is what we call the qubit overhead curve, right? Which just shows with some particular way of doing error correction. I have to discuss what is this way. And there's a lot of choices there, but this is a particular one. I'll show you next. Uh, show that, you know, the smaller the error rates of your gates, the better is the overhead. If the error rate is too high, there is a threshold. If it's bigger than that, error correction does not work. We also know that, right? So it must be good enough. Uh, but if you're very close to the threshold, the overhead is just horrible. So, so we, we don't want to be there either, right? So, so we want to be relative, we want to have relatively good error rates and think about like, you know, 10 to the minus three, something like this, at least, I think that's required. And then we still have some kind of challenge overhead of like 100, 500, something like this, uh, which means, right, that uh, we have to scale up these systems to some good size. And then we think things work and we can get a useful technology. So let me revisit these numbers I showed you before. If you assume the 0.1% error rate for the gates, right? I say qubits, but this should more be the, the gates error rates. It's better to think like that. Then you find more challenging situation, but we, but we hope one day to be there, right? So for factory, you need like, you know, more than 10 million qubits. For chemistry applications, a million qubits. For material science, like this Herbert model, that's probably one of the early, would be one of the early applications as far as we know today, like 100,000 qubits or 200,000 qubits, we maybe can do it. And this, I, I will revisit this with the new work we did, but that, that was before, right, this work we did. And then for optimization, maybe also a million qubits. So it's get challenging, right? And um, we know many people do not want to wait until we get there. So there's some ideas how to do some, you know, heuristics today that I might mention in the end, if I have time. But as far as we know, for the applications that we know today and that we know they're useful, this is what it takes, right? Uh, so, so there is a big, you know, there, there's a big payoff you can have, uh, not only building better hardware, but just bringing out these numbers, right? So, and this work that theories can do, right? So we can come up with better error correction schemes uh, or better ways of doing gates. Uh, and then we can bring these numbers down in principle, right? But this is where they are today. So how I got these numbers? Well, using this scheme for fault tolerance, which uses the surface code. So the surface codes, uh, you encode one logical qubit in, into a two-dimensional array of qubits. And the number of qubits that we have there uh, depends on what we call the distance of the code. The distance is just the size of, of the square, right? It's on the square, there's the size of the square is D. And the number of qubits is 2D squared minus D in the code. And that's the overhead, right? So you go from one logical qubit to 2D squared physical qubits. Uh, and the way that error correction works, which is pretty interesting and very important, right? Is that, you know, you want to detect that you have an error, uh, but you, and you have to do measurements to do that, but you cannot really measure the whole quantum state, right? Because then you collapse it and then that's it. Uh, you don't have your information anymore. So the way you do that is that you have your, uh, you have your physical qubits here and the physical qubits in this plot are these white, uh, you know, uh, circles. They are, they, are, they are the data qubits where the computation is, right? Where the, you know, the, your logical qubit is, but you introduce some what you call ancilla qubits, which is the black circles here. And then you keep measuring these ancilla qubits many times. So, so you apply a very simple circuit, which basically just you know, copies, measure the parity of some observables like XXX, X or ZZZZ in the surface code, uh, measure the parity in some subspace, right? Off the data qubits to the ancilla qubits, you measure the ancilla qubits, and then you only learn the information about this parity, right? Nothing more, and that's very important. And then if you do that, you can show that this works and this gives a good logical qubit. If you only have surface codes, like a asymmetric surface code and is squashed to one line, you get a repetition code. So you can think of surface code as some, you know, quantum version of the repetition code, but it gets more complicated, right? And that's, and that's general. It's just harder to protect quantum information than, than, than classical because the qubit is more, you know, fragile, right? So, so basically it's not like continuous, but instead of just protecting from, from bit flips, right? Going from zero to one, in quantum mechanics, you have to protect from bit flips, of course, but you also have to protect, protect from phase, phase flips where you change the phase in the qubits. And then if you correct these two kinds of errors, then you are, you are fine, you're good, but you, know, you have to correct two things and, and it's more subtle. So we do understand, you know, uh, uh, this is the formula for the logical probability of error as a function of the physical probability of error. So as I mentioned, right, there's a threshold, the threshold is like around 1%, right? If it's more than 1%, this goes up, right? Uh, and if it's more than 1%, the physical error rate, then there is this exponential drop off, drop off in the distance of the code that I mentioned to you before, right? Now, if you put some numbers in, you see that this works and it's great, but it's challenging, right? Because 
you know, where we are today, maybe today, depending how you think about things, you are like 0.5% fee square rates, right? For the two qubit gates. And then you see that, you know, distance five, which is already 50 qubits, there's no gain yet, right? The, the logical error rate is bigger. If you go to distance nine, which is like 200 qubits, then you have a gain, but it's still a marginal gain, right? If you go to distance 15, which is what is like a 15 square, so uh, 200, it's like 500 qubits. Then, then you have this four times 10 to the minus four, which starts being interesting, but it's still far away from you know where we want to be. So now, if you have 0 0.1 error rate, then you see that it's much better, right? At distance 15, you are 10 to the minus nine. If you are 10 to the minus nine, we are good to go. We have many applications we can run at this error rate, logical error rate. But as I mentioned, right, you need 434 qubits for that. Uh, so there is there is the overhead, it, which is you know uh, significant, and there is this like bare minimum uh, physical error rates that you must have in the lab, which is also challenging, right? And this combination is what makes you know scaling up quantum computers not very easy. Uh, but there is progress being made in both, right? Uh, and and I think we will get there. Uh, so currently, I say one percent or zero point five percent. That's because in the surface code you have to use CNOT. Uh, in the state of the art, maybe in the Google experiment, for example, they use CZ, which is a different gate. We can also use surface code with CZ, so it depends how you do. So we are, you know, we are, yeah, we are roughly here. I I would say we want to be here. Yeah, we, we are roughly here, here. That's where we are if you want to do error correction. And even then, it, you know, no one has done a logical qubit yet. That's a big, that's like a, a big next milestone in the field, I think. But if one would try, maybe we'll be right here today, which that's why we cannot do because there will be no gain, right? Uh, and we want to move you know, as fast as we can move here up to, to this situation here. So, you know, like just for example, for factoring, right? That I mentioned before, people work out uh, what it takes. Short algorithm gives 6,000 logical qubits as I mentioned, but it's a very, very long circuit. Okay, you need 10 to the 12, uh, 10 to the minus 12 error rate. You have to do like, you know, 10 to the 10 gates, 10 billion gates. And of course, each one has to be reliable, right? So you can work out that you need 10 to the minus 12 error rates, very, very small. So what you need, people work out in this paper, you need 20 million qubits if you have this 10 to the minus three error rate. So, so challenging, right? If you want to do the eight by eight Herbert model, it's an interesting many body model. We cannot simulate this classically. Many people think that's very important for like high temperature superconductors or if you understand cube rates, right? And so on. Uh, so, and for like batteries, people simulate this Hubble model as well, right, in, in industry. So, so that's an interesting model. Uh, people work out before that you need 132 logical qubits because you have to double because it's fermions. You have to simulate fermions. Uh, and you need 10 to the minus eight error rate. So you need like a million gates roughly here. So if you translate a new surface code, this translates to 300,000 qubits, better, but it's still a lot, right, at 10 to the minus three error rates. So the question that I want to ask now is, okay, great. So one can do surface codes. We can do this good enough qubits. Maybe we're getting there, right? Maybe like, you know, in five years, we can have this 10 to minus three. Maybe in two years, we can have this 10 to minus three error rates. But then we need to scale up in a massive way, right? And that's kind of dawning as well. So uh, alternative idea that people uh, consider is if, is if there is a more hardware efficient way of doing fault tolerance and error correction, right? So maybe we can do a better qubit, right? Maybe we can do a qubit for which the error rate is less than 10 to the minus three. And then we have a gain because not, we require right, less components to get to the final end result that we want. So of course, this is the idea of Majorana qubits, right? Uh, many people are trying for a while. Uh, we don't have the qubits yet, but no, maybe one day uh, people who try this think that one day we'll get it. And once we get it, the error rates will just be much better right, than what we have today. It's uh, unclear in my opinion, but it's worthwhile doing, I think, exploring. But that's not the only approach. In superconducting qubits, people also propose like the zero pi qubit, which has some protection and it could lead to better qubits and better gates. And uh, the uh, architecture that Amazon was considering, is considering, is using what we call cat qubits. They will use some extra degrees of freedom, like a harmonic oscillator that I mentioned before. And we encode some particular states of, of light or of vibrations in these harmonic oscillators. And then we think this gives some extra uh, level of error correction and might lead to better overheads. There is some risks, right, if you want to do this approach. And the risk is that, you know, we might put excessive focus on the building block and we might lose sight of the final goal, right? So what is the final goal? The final goal is to get logical qubits with target error rates for a useful application, right? So that's what we want to do. So we don't want to have like a, you know, beautiful qubit or, or so for example, if you want to try to optimize too much uh, T1 time, coherence time, 
or the physical error rates that you have, right? Or the probability of winning a Nobel Prize because it's so so beautiful physics that you're doing, right? Or and so on. This is not necessarily the right metrics, right? So so you know the you have to keep eye on the big price, right? And and then kind of uh, be, be pragmatic about it, right? So so that's kind of the approach that you know we are trying to have at at Amazon Web Service, right? In quantum computing, we're trying to be pragmatic, right? So. So we we are, we are trying to take an agnostic approach and, and be open to a hybrid of hardware and software error correction. Software error correction, I mean like surface code, right? The outer codes. Uh, and hardware, I mean you know having better qubits than just a transmont or just a two-level system with some uh, with some uh, physical error rate there. But we want to evaluate ideas quickly, and we don't want to get too much attached, right? So, so there's all this idea, which you know is uh, central to Amazon, which is to work backwards, right? So in this case, we want to work backwards from target applications to where we want to be. And in this work that I present next, we work backwards from solving this Herbert model on an eight by eight lattice. Why? Because you know, from what we know today, this might be one of the easiest applications to get worked out. And then we want to think, what's the full stack for the proposed architecture to get there, right? So we want to think from you know applications in this case hybrid model from the error correction architecture, and all the details that goes into the lab when building it, right? So like system integration, test and measurement, fabrication, hardware design, uh, to get you know to evaluate the idea and see if it's a good one, and then keep refining it, right? And in this way, we feel we can avoid many of the pitfalls that I mentioned. So for example, you might have good coherence of your qubits, but you might have very bad physical gates, right? And and this happens sometimes. Or actually, you might have bad physical gates, meaning they are you know, noise, noisier than other approaches. But because they are special, uh, you can have very good logical gates in the end. And actually, this will happen in that scheme that we are considering. Uh, or maybe you know the logical gate set that you get in, in a fault tolerant way has very high overhead for your, for your application, for your algorithm. And then that's not a good choice, right? Or maybe everything is great, but just your physical gates are very, very slow. And then in the end, you, know, you have a very slow clock cycle and, and then it might not be practical, right? And for example, for ion traps, that's a little bit of a concern, right? We have to be very careful when thinking about error correction because they are 1,000 slower than supercrossing qubits, for example, right? And, and this thousand factor can be a big thing, right? Think about the cycle of our computers is one nanosecond. Uh, with error correction in the surface code, for example, the cycle becomes 100 microseconds. So it's a 10 to the 5 separation between the cycle of classical and this potential quantum computer. So this is already start getting dangerous, right? If it's like a thousand more, you cannot run the applications, right? It just gets too slow. Uh, so clock cycle is very important, and many times this is uh, ignored. So so what is this? Um, so so I'll finish like in five minutes. I just want to mention very briefly, right? What what this work that that we did? Um, you can check in the paper. So so the title is building a fault tolerant quantum computer using this concatenated cat codes. So use this idea of cat codes. But you know, also uh, also consider how you can uh, how you can combine this together with some outer code, with kind of like software correction if you want, right? And and then consider and then we analyze really the whole scheme, right? From the details of experimental setup that we want to build to to engineer this, all the way to the final uh, you know resource counts for running the Hubber model application. Uh, so there's a lot of people involved in this, right? It was great working with them. Uh, so um, as, as, as uh, Leandro mentioned, I, I, I lead the Fury effort at AWS on, on the RNG side, right? And, and my colleague, Oscar Painter, he, he's the head of hardware, right? So he, he will build this stuff in the end. He has the hardest job. Uh, but but we, you know, we, we are hiring a lot in, in, uh, in last year. And these are some of the people, mostly from the Fury team, but also people from the experimental team that work together to think about these proposals. So you can check on the archive if you want. I will only mention, like maybe very little about it, but we, we found some promising conclusion, I think in, in, our, uh, in our opinion, though there's some challenges that I also wanna mention. Uh, so for example, we found that if you wanna have 100 logical qubits, use this architecture that we propose, which is like, uh, can also use the surface code as part of it, but it's, it's, it's more to it, right? It's, there's this hardware efficient way of doing uh, error correction as well. If you use 100, if you wanna have 100 logical qubits, and like 10,000 logical gates, which is a regime which would be very interesting to get to, right? Much better than what we have today. But again, we don't know applications that require only 10,000 logical gates today. Although, you know, there's like heuristic things we can do and maybe they work. This we found that you can do this with around like 1,000 to 2,000 
physical qubits and qubits is in quotes because they are a little bit different. I tell you what they are. And we're excited about this because this is a regime that we think, you know, if, if, you, if you just order a big enough reach, right, that is available today and a little bit better, we can put 2,000 of these physical qubits there. And it'll be very hard to do it to make it work, but it, it's something that we see in you know, a clear path in the next like five years or so. So uh, it's something that would be exciting to try. If you want to go to this application regime, for example, uh, simulating the A by A Hubble model, then we found out that with uh, 20,000 of these physical qubits, you can do it. 20 to 30,000, depends how you count. That's like, you know, 10x better, right, than this number I gave you before. So it's a big improvement. Uh, so it's also promising on getting there. Of course, it's more challenging to get there, right? Uh, and there's some drawbacks as well that I, I will mention to you, but I'll mention later. Uh, so, so maybe let me, um, well, Leon, how, for how much time should I speak? Just so we started, we, we started seven minutes later, Fernando. So, and, and for QA, mean, how, how much time do we should we leave? I mean, what I, I think it's fine if you go, go let's, let's continue 10, nine, 10 more minutes. And finish okay. in ten minutes if okay. you can. Okay. All right. I, th that, I think perfect. that yeah. I think that there's no rush from our side. Um, okay. That, that, yeah, that so works. Right. So, so ten more minutes. Yeah. Sounds Thank good. You. Yeah. So so you know let, let me tell just uh, there's all this detail in the scheme right I will not tell them but let me tell the central component of it uh, because it's an interesting idea uh, in itself right and it's it's not something novel that we come up with many people are doing that for a long time but uh, but at least we learn the power of this idea doing this analysis so so in my might also be useful for you and 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 uh, the projects you're doing. So this is the idea of a cat code. So what do you want to do in a cat code? You wanna um, you wanna encode qubits into kind of classical states of light. So you imagine that you have a harmonic oscillator, uh, and now you can have what we call a coherent state there, right? So coherent state is just you know our quantum mechanical description for for a classical state there. So this harmonic oscillator you can think of light, right? It can be just uh, you know, a Fabry-Pérot uh, cavity, if you want. It can be any other kinds of electromagnetic cavities, a three-dimensional aluminum cavity. It can also be like vibrations, right? So people also do, you know, they have this tiny cavities and they vibrate and then there's a harmonic oscillator there as well. Or it can be something else. But then you imagine that you can create this coherent state. It's very easy to create this coherent state usually. And, and, and this is a coherent state like plus alpha with mean photon number alpha square, okay? And now you encode your qubits in two coherent states alpha and minus alpha. So they only differ by the phase of the amplitude of the coherent states. They are not really orthogonal, but if alpha is big, they're almost orthogonal. And if you go to the complementary basis, then they are perfectly orthogonal if you define it this way. Uh, now we're interested in alpha, you know, like uh, six, eight, alpha square six, eight, right? So you have like eight photons in your resonator or six. And, and then they're really, really orthogonal. Uh, and what we do is, Using a physical process, a nonlinear physical process, and that's why you know superconducting qubits or superconducting qubits elements they are useful because they are highly nonlinear, right? As I mentioned, uh, we engineer a two-photon dissipation bath. Okay, so so this is like an artificial uh, engineered dissipation bath where A is the annihilation operator of your photons, and now you lose photons in pairs. Okay, and you put a two-photon drive with amplitude alpha square. So this kappa two is the rate that you lose photons in pairs to an uh, engineer bath that you create. Of course, you have the decoherence that you do not control. So you lose photons at rate kappa one and you have the phasing at, at rate kappa five. Uh, so, so now what you can see is that um, if you put this two photon engineer uh, bath, bit flips the probability of for going from alpha to minus alpha, there is a big penalty of going there. Right, so, so first you can see the alpha and minus alpha, they are the steady states of the dissipator, right? So if you apply A squared minus alpha squared to them, you get zero, right? So they, they are the only steady states, they are the dark states there, and becomes exponentially suppressed in alpha squared to go from alpha to minus alpha. Uh, so, so then, you know, we can get a very good classical bits, right? So, so the bit flip errors are much less likely than phase flip errors, and they are less likely by exponential factor in alpha squared. Um, but bit flips actually, phase flips, they're still there and actually they increase linearly with alpha square. So what are you doing? You're biasing the noise, right? So you're making, you're kind of correcting X error at the expense of increasing the Z error a little bit. But that's kind of an interesting approach, right? Because now maybe your outer codes, you have to use a quantum error correction code, but they can only correct mostly Z errors, right? Only entirely Z errors. And then you can have much more efficient codes for doing that, right? Uh, 
But why this idea maybe doesn't work necessarily? Well, because once you have gates, the gates can map uh, Z errors into X errors, right? And then if you do that, you know, your Z errors become X errors and then X errors are not small anymore, right? Uh, so another component that only exists for continuous variable systems, like for the harmonic oscillator, is this idea of a bias preserving gate. And this was done by Gilad de Miharimi like two years ago and in a very interesting paper. So, so in error correction, you need the C0. So the C0 is an interesting gate, it's an important gate. And you see that the C0, if you have a Z poly observable, it maps to Z. If you have a Z on the, on the target, it maps to, to, to Z and the same for X. So, so this is what we call like, it, it preserve the bias, right? Uh, you know, if you have a bias in Z or in X, you will preserve because it doesn't map X to Z, doesn't map the Z to X. But that's not the right way to think about that because the C0, you have to engineer some Hamiltonian to implement it, right? And if there is errors in the middle of the evolution, and that's what we should really think that happens, it will map Z errors into X and vice versa. Uh, actually, there is a proof, right? That in finite dimensions, you cannot have a, you know, a bias preserving gates. But in, in continuous variables, you can. And that's one way of doing that. So you have two targets. You have two cavities, right? You have two modes, the control and the targets. The control, you engineer two photon dissipation. And the target, you engineer two photon dissipation. But where the phase changes depending if the control is zero or one. If it's zero, it's a normal two photon dissipation. If it's one, it's a two photon dissipation where you slowly change the phase from alpha to minus alpha. And that's how you implement the C not gate. And, but this is adiabatic, so this works, and that's how we propose to do it, and that's how we're trying to do it. But this is low, and as an effect, the, the fidelity of this not gate is not that great, right? And that's what I was mentioning before, exactly because these are diabatic errors. So now, you know, one can build a logical qubit in a much simpler way, right? So, so, so let's correct all X errors using the CAD code. Let's use this bias preserving gate, so, so Z doesn't get mapped into X. So we know we are fine with X errors, so we only have to correct Z errors. But if you only have to correct Z errors, that's just like, you know, we can use a classical error correcting code, right? And in particular, we can use the simplest classical error correcting code that I mentioned to you before, the, rep the repetition codes. So let's use a cat code. And now uh, the outer code, the logical plus states, is just the cat plus states and copies of it. Repetition code. And, and the logical minus state is just the logical uh, is, is the minus cat state and n times repetition. And then if you do it, and this was considered on this level on this paper that I mentioned before, you can get a logical qubit. And then you can get some, some good results uh, there. So how we want to do this in the lab, we want to use this, this phononic band gaps so they can vibrate. That's our harmonic oscillator. Why we want to do it? Well, because like in Oscar's lab, they measure up to 1.5 second coherence microwave frequency, which is very promising. Uh, although we have to couple now this, uh, you know, we have to use a piezoelectric electric coupling to couple the vibrations to kind of like a superconducting qubit, right? To implement the logic because we have to get right some uh, some nonlinearity here, and this coupling can be challenging. That's something we have to figure out. But that's our approach. Uh, what is our superconducting qubit? Is what we call an ACS asymmetric threaded squid. Uh, don't worry about this. It's just a way of engineering this two, uh, this uh, you know, two photon dissipation path. This was done experimentally, actually, in this Lescan paper, not using vibrations, right? Not using acoustics, but using ENM. And they got, and they saw a big suppression, but probably you have to do it better uh, to really get the gain in this scheme. And, and, and our work, you know, we analyze a feasibility of the hardware, right? Using this for non plus HCS. Then we analyze the cat code gates and measurement times. Then we look at the error correction scheme, which is either the repetition code, depending on the logical error rate or the surface codes. But, but the strip surface code is a much smaller surface code in the X direction. And then we, we analyze how to do logical gates. And for that, we develop some new ways of doing match state distillation for Toffoli gates. So, so, you know, like it's not enough to get a logical qubit, you have to apply logical gates and it can be pretty tricky to apply useful logical gates. So we develop our way of doing that. And that's how, you know, putting everything together, we get this like, you know, 2000 qubits for the Herbert model, uh, sorry, 20,000 qubits for the Herbert model or like a thousand qubits for an interesting near-term uh, fault tolerance regime. Now, what is the catch? The catch is that, do I have it here? Uh, the, the, the catch is that if we want to make this good, get to this good regime, we need cap, we need like, you know, uh, probability of C0 gates to be like four times 10 to the minus three, right? So, so it's so bigger actually than what I showed you before for this estimate of surface code. But because the gates are so slow, 
we need a very small ratio of kappa one, the photon loss that we don't control, and kappa one, the one we engineer, of like 10 to the minus five. And as an effect, once you do the full analysis, we need some very long coherence times for our acoustic resonators, like, you know, 30 microseconds or so. Sorry, sorry, like 20 milliseconds to 30 milliseconds. So we think we can get there, right? And, and you know, in itself, they can go up to a second. So it's very promising. But, but coupling them to the ATS and get it to 30 milliseconds is a challenge. And we have to see how to get there. So let me jump this. Let me also jump this. I'm out of time. So as I mentioned, right, we are working on this on this AWS Center for Quantum Computing. This is at Caltech uh, campus. That's the building will be ready in August. There's theory and experimental research, experimental led by, by Oscar, as I mentioned. We have this long-term goal of building a quantum computer. We know it's a it's challenge where right? it take a long time, but we are, you know, we we want to try. Uh, and we are hiring, and we always open, you know, to collaborate and talk to other people. So hopefully, uh, we will have things to talk about uh, with you guys as well. So 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 conclusions, right? Quantum computing is really a marathon, right? Not a sprint. So let's keep our expectations, right? Realistic, and there is definitely value, but it's long-term value. I think it's very interesting to take a holistic view of like considering hardware, error correction scheme, algorithm primi primitives and end application whenever we are working out future use cases of quantum computing, right? So if you don't have the, the complete picture, we might get lost into, you know, the wrong metrics, I think. I, I argue briefly that these cat codes are promising, but I think more, more work is needed, right? So we should look at alternatives like GKP or Kerkat, and of course, you know, we have to get experimental results and show that this actually works well in the lab, right? So that's all. I'll stop here. Thanks for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Fernando, for the, for the wonderful uh, introductory uh, talk also. That's very nice. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions. Um, and I see many questions. Uh, so I see a couple of questions by Luigi and then by Carlos. So I think that I will give the word to, to Luigi um, so, that, so that he asks the question speaking instead of writing. Okay, Luigi, so you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, very nice talk and introduction to, the, this, uh, to your work. Say, I have, uh, uh, say a few questions that I basically, uh, I'm not aware or I'm not familiar with the surface code. So are they related to the story codes? Say? Yeah, they're they they exactly, yeah. They, they are the Tori codes. So Tori code, it's not a Taurus, right? That's the reason for the name. Uh, surface code, it's in a plane, but then because it's a plane, you have to put some boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions, they are different than, than the Tori code, but inside in the book is exactly the same as, as the Tori code. Uh, so it's a Tori code on open, uh, uh, with, with, with open, uh, uh, in, uh, with different boundary exactly. conditions. Basically. Exactly. So, yeah. Anyway, the Hamiltonian is similar. So you have a bunch of star and a bunch of that's of, right uh, of plaquettes, right? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, then uh, uh, I so you thought so so you mentioned this uh, uh, engineered bath. Uh, yes. E exchanging two photons. That's okay. right. Yeah. So, what are the principles of this uh, uh, of this bath? So, somehow, what is the scheme? So, what what is the scheme you oh, have yeah. in mind? In mind, not, not not sure if you realize. Yeah, but... I, I I I had to try to go quickly over this, but I can give you in like a few seconds. So, mm -hmm. let me go back here. Is this which has been exp experimentally demonstrated in this lab? So the idea is that you have your harmonic oscillator, we call the cat qubit here, right? It's just a linear harmonic oscillator. Mm -hmm. And then you couple to what is called ACS, which is a LC circuit again, but with two just conjunctions, okay? Uh, and, and, and then you couple, there's a piezoelectric film that couples you know, uh, mechanics to electrics, to electrical signal. Uh, okay. And then you put two flux lines, and you put these two flux lines, uh, you don't have to work it out, right? And you also put, you know, like, uh, you choose a pump drive, with this frequency, you can engineer this Hamiltonian. So, so A is the annihilation operator of the cat qubits, yes. and B is the creation of the is the creation operator of this buffer modes. 
So now you have a nonlinear process, right? So you, you use the nonlinearity of the just conjunction and you engineer this process where, you know, you exchange two excitations from the A mode by one excitation of the B mode. Mm -hmm. uh, but now if the B mode is lossy and you can just put, you know, the loss kind of big the way you want, right? So two excitations go from, from the cat qubit to the buffer and they leak. This leads to this two photon dispersive process that you want. Okay. So, so that's how you do it. That's how we, we think we are, we are trying to do it. Yeah, very good. But uh, say, say, very short question. So can you somehow yeah. say, say, can you use this kind of trick uh, to make uh, a more complicated engineering of the bug? Or is it uh, that kind of device works only for this two photon bug? No, you can. You have a lot of flexibility in supercrossing qubits, like to, to engineer interesting BF. The, the price you pay is that the higher the nonlinearity that you want, right? The, the smaller is the coupling, right? So, so there's no free lunch, but, but you know, you, if you have an interesting BF, there's always, I can't, I, pretty much there's always a scheme to implement it using, you know, subgressing uh, elements. You just have to see what is the strength that you get. And if this strength is good enough, what do you want to do, right? But in this case, we, that, that's the analysis we did and it was kind of uh, promising. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you very much, Luigi, for the question. I see a question of Carlos, but um, before before reading Carlos' question, let, let me let me ask. So I have a question connected to 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 Luigi's question. So okay, so you you showed very nicely how to implement a two photon uh, process, uh, how to engineer the bath to implement the two uh, that two pro two photon process on the on the physical cat qubit. But why? So what, what was not clear for me is why does this imply a suppression, an exponential suppression on one um, block direction of the of the logical encoding, whereas a linear increase in in the other one? Like uh -huh. so. So is is that easy to transmit with some simple intuition? Why um, the two process? Why the two process Hamiltonian allows you to suppress the uh, the uh, Right, right. So, so this is, yeah, you can do a semi-classical calculation and get this, right? You get a potential there that kind of, you know, when you increase kappa two, the pot, okay, so, but, but let me see if I, there is like a easier way to understand this. Um, so, um, yeah, I, 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 that's, that's the only way I would know how to explain this, but, but, you know, you have a, uh, you can write like some semi classical equations of motion for this, right? And then, and then this equation you find that uh, you have two wells, which is alpha minus alpha, okay, mm -hmm. in k space. And, and these wells, uh, the depth mm -hmm. of the wells, they are given by kappa two, right? The strength of your two photon dissipation, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, they are, you know, they, they are the steady states, right? Because they are, this is easy to check, right? So, you can just check they are dark states of, of that thing. Uh, but in the same class, they have this well, and then you control the depth of the well by, by kappa two. Uh, but now what is a bit flip? You have to go from one right a stable element to the other one, right? You have to do this jump, right? Mm -hmm. And this gets exponentially suppressed in the I depth see, of the well, see. right? So that's see, how you can I understand see. it. But 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 the phase, you know, the phase doesn't the phase you already superposition between them, right? And you just have to right change the phase there. So mm -hmm. then you don't have this protection right from from the depth of right. the well, right? So okay, that, that's that's yeah. great. That's great. Okay, that, that was that was, that was good enough an answer. Thank you so much, Fernando. So let, let's, um, so Carlos, I guess, uh, so you wrote your question very uh, clearly here. So I will just read it, okay? If you need to add something, then raise your hand, okay? So Carlos, um, he's asking the following thing. He's asking, do you think that quadratic speed ups, for instance, Grover-like algorithms will eventually vanish given the significant overhead for fault tolerant uh, quantum computing? Uh, should instead the quantum algorithm community focus on exponential speedups for practical applications in the future? Um, uh, yeah, great question. Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, it all depends on how fa Yeah, it all depends on the full full stack, right? As I was mentioned, that's why it's important to think about it, right? So, so for example, suppose you just use the surface code, right? Um, and then and and just transmods, right? As an example, right? So as I mentioned, ion traps would be like thousand times worse, right? So, but even with surface code is and, and transmod is challenging, right? Then we have like what gates is, is let's suppose the two qubit gets 10, 10 nanoseconds, then you use the surface code. If you want to get to you know 10 to the minus nine logical error rate, something like this, then the cycle is like 100 microseconds, right? To apply one gate. So very slow, right? Uh, now, if you think, and the cycle for the classical computer is like one nanosecond, right? So you have 10 to the five, right, uh, error rates. 
now, now you have a quadratic speed up, right? So to have a break even point, right? Uh, you have to be in a regime where you apply 10 to the 10 operations, right? Because then, you know, 10 to the 10 classically, uh, square root quantum 10 to the five, but there's this 10 to the five initial, right? Just constant, but huge, right? Offset, so 10 to the 10. And then, you know, 10 to the 10 operations, um, okay, that's it's okay, right? So you, you could get again, 10 to the 10 operations, not that, that long, right? And sometimes you want to use this for some classical heuristics. But the problem then is that there is parallel computing classic as well, right? So in parallel computing is very cheap, right? So if you put parallel computing and usually you can parallelize very easily these optimization problems, then you know you might have another 10 to the 10 factor, right? And then and then indeed it's, it's washed out, right? So then there is no gain. Uh, so how can you prove this? Well, you can improve in a few different ways. So one way you can just try to get this clock cycle down in, in the quantum problem, right? And, and you can have faster gates. That's more like experimental problem. There is some ideas how to make them faster, but you know there's also limitations, right? I don't think they would be, maybe like it'll be one on a second less than that, maybe it's hard. But you can try, you know, for example, using using these cat codes, the way I showed they're very slow. That was the problem, right? But you know, maybe using some other cat code approach, like her cat, for example, you look at this now, maybe you can get as fast gates as, as for transmodes. But then the error correction scheme is much simpler, right? And this also brings like, you know, it'll be faster as well. So maybe you can bring these hundred microseconds down, right? So and and I think it's, this will happen. Like maybe take a while, but you know, might, we might have factors of like hundreds or thousand there, and then things get better already, right? But another problem is what, exactly what you mentioned. I think it's a very important question: How do you get more than quadratic speed up, right? Uh, algorithms for optimization, right? Uh, there is heuristics like Adiabatic optimization, right? So in principle, you can get up to right exponential, although who knows. Uh, but that's something that definitely people will try. There is some interesting approach, like you know, there is a recent paper by Matt Hastings where they can he can prove they get better than Grover speed up for some optimization problems. We've been looking at that, and we and sometimes we we, we get we're getting from that scheme like uh, you know quartic to even one over five speed ups. Uh, and then if you do the same estimate that I'm doing, situation is much better for quartic speed up. So so you don't really have to go to exponential. If you have exponential, it's great. But quadratic is indeed challenging from what we know today. But if you go to quartic already or something like this, the situation is much better already. And then, you know, it's, it's, it, it looks promising that you get a, a press to speed up in the future. So, so I agree with you. There is like these two, right, two directions of research, how to make this better. But I, I, I definitely agree that it's too simplistic just to say oh, we have Grover, we have all these applications, right? Usually, indeed, they are washed out in, in the current method that we think of doing things. Great. Great. Thank you. Great question, Carlos, and great answer, Fernando. Um, okay, so I guess I'll have to close. Let, let me close with a final consideration kind of question, like easy question. So, so here you showed us very nicely, um, like the proposal with the CAD code encoding. And in the end of your talk, you also mentioned uh, other possibilities, the G, GKP or CareCAD encoding. So it's all pointing towards continuous variable qubit encodings. And then you mentioned the application of the of the Harvard model as one of the first potential applications and what can look at in in in, in continuous variables too. And uh, what like one of your goals was to have like a Harvard model simulation for eight for a lattice of eight times eight sides, right? And my question is: so uh, we know that Harvard model simulations may reveal some interesting information about high DC superconductivity. But um, do you think that with eight times eight uh, lattice um, sizes, will one already um, observe some interesting new physics, or or will the question, eight I, I, I don't know that the eight by eight right, choice right. is that there is where it's clearly a half feeling. That's where it's clearly the current methods they just fail and they, they're not giving good results from what the chemist told me. Right, other right. people simulating this. <laughs> Uh, but if that's indeed enough to, you know, to, to have, basically want to be big enough that the, uh, the finite size effects are not so relevant, right? Um, it's not clear to me. It might be that you need bigger. Yeah. So, right. uh, so, you know, the, yeah, the, indeed, that, that's not, that's not the end result you want to have, right? So, but, but that will be the first, I think, is, as we know today, is like the first, you know, model you can simulate on the quantum computer, which people try to do it. And it's an interesting, important model. And, and at the minimum size for which kind of, you know, it, it, it would make sense to use a quantum computer because it's already so hard classically, right? But it might not indeed give the right answer that you want yet. Maybe you have to build a little bit bigger system, right, and get there. Mm 